Good morning! Today is the 31st day of December in 2023, and this will be the last sermon I preach this year. And, uh, well, we start a new year, 2024. Such big numbers! I was looking forward to 1980 not long ago. So, this week... We're preaching a sermon next week. We're going back to Hebrews, but this week we're preaching from Matthew 24, a sign of the times. And so I'm going to read selective uh, scriptures from Matthew 24, uh, starting with verse one. Jesus left the temple and was going away when his disciples came to point out to him the buildings of the temple. But he answered and said, see all these, do you not? Truly I say, there will not be one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. And then in verse 3, it says, As he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, What will these things be, and what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? And Jesus said, See to it that no one leads you astray. That is the key verse here. For many will come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and will lead many astray. You'll hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you're not alarmed. For this must take place, and the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. There'll be famines and earthquakes in various places. But all these are the beginning of birth pangs. Then you will deliver them up to tribulation, put you to death. You'll be hated by all nations for my name's sake. Many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. Many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. Because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end will be saved, and this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed through all the earth as a testimony to all and then the end will come. And then we look at verse 15. It says, When you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place. Then we look at verse 32 says, From the fig tree learn its lesson. As soon as the branch is tender and put out its leaves, you know that summer is nigh. And then we look at verse 36. But concerning the day and the hour, no one knows not the Father, not even the angels, which art in heaven. Well, the key verse to all of this is in verse 1 through 4, Be not deceived. Now, there are two contexts and two fulfillments and two questions. The two questions they asked were this, When will these things be, and what will be the sign of his coming? The two contexts are the destruction of the temple that Jesus was talking to them about and his second coming. Now, here's the complication of this chapter. I don't know why it took me 40 years to figure this out, but Jesus was not answering, or Jesus was answering a question. He was not laying out an eschatological timeline. One of the things that always bothers me about Matthew 24 is it intermixes the rapture and the revelation into kind of one big pile of spaghetti. And that's because Jesus wasn't trying to lay out a timeline. He was trying to tell them when these things would be. So the big statement is, do not be deceived. And there are five things in this chapter that Jesus points out that he doesn't want you to be deceived about. And the first thing in verse 5 through 8 is history. Human history is drama caused by human events and natural events. And there are Three specifics that Jesus brings up. The first is false prophets. And by the way, many of our problems are caused by false prophets. 
One of the things that some people are saying today is that religion is the cause of all of our problems, and so we should eliminate all religion. Let me tell you, if we didn't have the prophet Muhammad, the Middle East would not be quite as big a tinderbox as it is. The second human event is war. And, you know, we talk about war. I read some years ago that at any time on our planet, there's about 40 wars going on. We're only concerned with two, and that is the war in Israel and the war in Ukraine, and maybe the potential of war with China in the straits there between uh, in the South China Sea there. But Jesus said, don't be alarmed for this must take place. And I understand that don't be alarmed, but this must take place. Well, it's history. It's what has happened. It is what's going to happen. There's always going to be another war. There's always going to be another place. There are places across the world where they're fighting and we don't even hear it on the news. And then in history, there's a natural phenomenon. The famines and the earthquakes. I shared with you a couple weeks ago how what an impact on my life uh, when in 1968 the tornado went through my hometown of Charles City, Iowa. What an impact it had upon New Orleans when that was the earthquake or the uh, tidal wave came and it overcame the walls and the whole city was flooded and it was a disaster. And there are people who say, why do we have so many of these today? And there are people that <laughs> say, well, obviously it must be global warming. We just had the warmest Christmas on record since 1939. So what was the excuse in 39? That's what I always ask. And uh, I, I hate to say this, but when I was a new Christian, people would take these things out of context. And I went to movies and I heard preachers talk about, well, they've been keeping track of earthquakes and there's more earthquakes every year. This is just increasing, showing Christ is returning. But remember all these wars? Jesus said, don't be alarmed. This must take place. And to all these earthquakes and famines, he said, it's the beginning of, er of birth pangs. In fact, if you study the scripture in Romans, it says, all creation groans for the revealing of the sons of God. The number of earthquakes have nothing to do with the return of Christ. And so, sad to say, all of this was preached to me as a young person. Why didn't that person read the whole scripture where it says, don't get concerned about that, it has nothing to do with it. Now, the second place where we've been deceived is about the church age. The church age is an era of time from the cross to the coming of Christ. And let's see what it says about the church age. First, it says, you will be hated for my name's sake. That's the church age. We always think, well, that's the great tribulation. It says they'll deliver you up to tribulation. Well, that's, there's tribulation and there's a great tribulation. We're not in the great tribulation right now, but guess what? If you're in China, where they're cracking down on the church again, you'd think it's the Great Tribulation. In fact, they just, uh, I just read a couple weeks ago, they put the head of the Communist Party is in charge of approving and disapproving what the churches can do and what they can own. They just made that decision. Did you know, Merry, Merry, Merry Christmas to you. I hope you had a good Christmas in Nigeria. The opposition, I assume they're Muslims, but I don't know that. The opposition decided to celebrate Christmas by killing Christians. So Saturday, Sunday, and Monday, Christmas Day, they murdered 160 Christians. 
because it was Christmas. You'll be hated for my name's sake. I read articles on real clear religion and real clear politics. And it's amazing how many articles that I have read. I read one article not long ago that said the reason that church attendance is down all over the country is because the church voted for Donald Trump. And I'm sitting there going, you know, the churches that voted for Donald Trump aren't having the church attendance problems. That's all the churches that are liberal. And I saw another article directed toward the evangelical church. It said Chris was a good time for the evangelical church to repent. Okay, so I read the article. It said we've been spending our money all wrong. We've been giving it to the wrong people. And then they went on to say that over half of the women in evangelical churches have had abortions. Do you believe that? I don't believe that. And in several other things, I wrote back to the guy and said, you know, when you write about something, you ought to find out and study it before you write because you don't know what you're talking about. I said, your articles are full of hatred. There is a growing group of people in the United States that hate evangelical Christians. Whoopee! That's the church age. That's the way it's been across this globe for years because of our religious freedom. And the stronghold of Christianity that's been in the United States, we have hardly known opposition. America's largest Bible college right now is being persecuted by the government. They just fined them $150 million, hoping to put them out of business. It's going on in America if you're a Christian. The second thing about the church age is false prophets will lead many people astray. This is not new today. It's not new to this century. It's went on forever. The third thing is lawlessness and coldness of love. We always call this a sign of the times, but it's a sign of the church age. It will be like this and has been like this for many, many years. And you say, oh, but it wasn't like that in the 1950s. The 1950s were the highest time of Christianity in our nation. Yeah, it probably wasn't like that, but it's been like that across the world forever. But the fourth principle that will happen in the church age is worldwide evangelism. This gospel will be proclaimed into all the world as a testimony to all the nations, and the end will come. A.B. Simpson used to have big conventions, and he, called, he put up a big banner, Bring Back the King! And by sending out missionaries and getting the gospel to the ends of the earth, we are bringing back Jesus. But let me tell you, don't be deceived about the church age. This is not heaven on earth. Coming to Christ will not make everything perfect in this world because we have a home beyond the sunset where everything is perfect, where we're going to spend eternity. But in this world, we have trouble. The third thing not to be deceived about is the abomination of desolation. What is it? Well, abomination is mainly used to denote idolatry, and in other cases it refer, refer, refers to inherently evil things as illicit sex, lying, murder, deceit, etc. Desolation is joyless discontent and sorrow as if you lost a loved one. So what is the abomination of desolation? It is an event so abominable that it leaves us emotionally and spiritually desolate. In prophecy, it describes a time when the Antichrist makes a seven-year covenant with the Jews in Jerusalem and the rest of the world. The first three and a half years are years of unparalleled peace in the world. And then at three and a half years, the sacrifice is ended and the abomination occurs where the Antichrist sets himself up in the temple. 
and does idolatry in the temple. And the last three and a half years of the tribulation period is a horrible, horrible thing you wouldn't want to endure. Now, <clears throat> if we look at the book of Daniel, chapter 7 and 8, it describes this more. You can also find things in Revelation and such. But I like Daniel because it talks about the little horn and the second little horn. The little, <clears throat> well, if you study Daniel, you'll find the shaggy goat with the one horn that skips across the land, and that is Alexander the Great. After he conquers the world, he dies, and four little horns come up, which are his four generals that took over each parts of the world. Among the four little hor four horns that came up was a little horn. And this little horn made a covenant with the Jews and then backtracked on his covenant. And it, it, he, Daniel writes about this, but you can also read about this in the writings of Josephus under the Maccabean revolt. And in 400 AD, Antiochus Epiphany made this covenant with the Jews. And when they opened the gates of the city, he came in with his army <clears throat> supposedly as a protectorate, but he came in, <coughs> raped the women, cut up women with babies, and went into the temple and sacrificed a hog on the altar of God. Now, there is a second little horn that comes up at a later date, and this is, by all scholars, believed to be the Antichrist. Someone would say, are there abominations today? Yes, there are. One abomination is globalism. This attempt, and we have politicians who believe this. There are people in the United Nations. It's an attempt to unite all under one world government. And we know that that one world government will be under the Antichrist. I spoke at this recently at a funeral and a lady told me it was such a good sermon till I got off on politics. And she said, that's wrong. And uh, well, fine, good for her. Second thing is the ecumenical movement that started back in the 1950s and 60s, where they wanted to join all churches together. And, uh, well, you had to sacrifice your doctrine, and one group was willing to do that, and one group wasn't. And now that is uh, proving to be a problem for those churches that did. And now the churches that joined in the ecumenical movement are approving abominations. And I think it's strange that so many churches are rushing to ordain and marry homosexuals. And they are splitting and willing to lose a fourth of their membership to do it. And now the biggest shock of all, I didn't expect this because the Pope this week said, well, we can't have homosexual marriages, but the priest can bless those relationships. <sighs> For years, I always said the Catholic Church was our protector in government and such because they believed the same things we believed in morals, and they would, they are so big they would protect us, but our protector is getting wobbly legs, God help us. So don't be deceived about the abomination of desolation it is on its way. The next thing don't be deceived about is Israel in verse 32 through 35. When I was a young teenager, <clears throat> especially when I got out of high school, I went down to Christian bookstore and I started buying all the books about prophecy and I read them. I was into prophecy. In those days, it was uh, Salem Kerbin was a big writer and Hal Lindsey. Those were the big writers in those days. I read everything I could read from those guys. And one of the things that those men taught 
was that Israel, uh, the fig tree was the symbol of Israel. So when in the scripture, it says, learn the lesson from the fig tree. When its leaves become tender and puts out its leaves, you know, summer is nigh. So they interpreted that symbolically. And, and of course, then it says, this generation shall not pass away till all these things take place. And they said, this means when Israel becomes a nation, that this generation shall not pass away till all these things take place. We all believed it because they said it. It was on thousands of books. I believed it and didn't even question it. Okay. <clears throat> Now, what I did question was the generation thing, because I learned that a generation is uh, an era, not 20 years or 40 years. But anyway, so this week when I went to study this chapter, I was reading through it and I came to this. And of course, my mind goes, oh, yeah, Israel became a nation. And then I read it and I said, where does it say that here? So then I said, well, obviously it's symbolic. So I better find the proof that the fig tree is symbolic of Israel. And I've been there and seen all those beautiful fig trees all over. Well, guess what? I found some Old Testament passages where it says Israel is like a fig tree. But I really couldn't find anything that I could stand up in court and say, fig tree is a symbol of Israel. In fact, the olive tree is Israel's official tree. There is no reference in the Bible that teaches that Israel is a fig tree. So if there is no reference in the Bible that teaches that Israel is a fig tree, then there is no proof that the return of Israel as a nation uh, is the marker that says this generation shall not pass away till all these things come to pass. And therefore, that's why when all the people said Jesus is coming back in 1968, because it's 20 years since Israel became a nation and he didn't come. And then in 88, they said, well, it's 40 years. That's a generation. And he didn't come. You know why he didn't come? Because he never said that when Israel became a nation, I'm coming back in this generation. He never said that. That is something the prophetic people have said. So what I did, I was kind of upset because this didn't make sense to me for the first time. It took me till I'm 65 to overcome the prejudices I learned when I was young. And what did I do? I went back and studied scholars. Now, we're not talking prophecy scholars. We're talking people who study the Word of God and study the language and are the scholarly experts. And I read about a dozen of them, and guess what? Not one of them believed that the fig tree was a symbol of Israel. There was one of them who discussed why it wasn't true. The rest of them didn't even follow it. So it is a simple parable. The simple parable is this, that the fig tree has two crops, one in the spring, one in late summer, and the early spring crop happens. The leaves come out and it has a little crop right away, and that happens a week before summer. You know summer is nigh. So this generation shall not pass away. And the word generation in the Greek is era. It is not a generation as we've seen. It has spawned so many false predictions in our lifetimes. It is pathetic. It makes a church look crazy and stupid. But if you want to know about the teaching of Israel becoming a nation, look in Ezekiel 39, 25 through 30, 29. It will talk about how God will gather them from all the world and bring them back. We've seen that in our lifetime. In fact, as I look at the context of this, the context would be better said when you see the abomination of desolation. 
you know that that generation will not pass away till this is all done. There is a second false teaching about Israel, and that is called replacement theology, where Israel was replaced by the church and therefore is a non-issue. But if we look in the book of Romans chapter 11, in verse 1, it says, Has God rejected his people by no means? In Romans 11:25, the scripture says, Lest you be wise in your own sight, I do not want you to be unaware of this mystery. A partial hardening has come upon Israel till the fullness of the Gentiles come. I am here to say God's covenants and promises are eternal. And God will fulfill all his covenants to Israel. There's a lot of exciting things coming for Israel in the tribulation and in the millennium. So now the fifth thing that God would not have you to be deceived about is the time of his coming. Memorize this well. No one knows the day or the hour of his coming. Not the angels. Not even the Son. Why wouldn't Jesus know it? I mean, Jesus knows all things. He is the Son of God. But God purposely, and Jesus purposely sought for him not to know because it's such a special time for the Lord. This is his delight, waiting for the Father to give him the go-ahead to go. Only the Father knows. So, we see some description of what the coming of the Lord is like. First, it's like the days of Noah, when they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage. When I went to a state college and I took biology at North Iowa Area Community College, one of the things they said was that here's the definition of life self-perpetuation and metabolism. Well, when they explained what self-perpetuation was and what metabolism is, it's marrying and giving in marriage and eating and drinking. That's what it is. So basically what the days of Noah were like where people were just having kids and marrying and living in life and, and eating and drinking and living and taking care of themselves with no thought of God unbelieving and they were surprised when Noah shut the door on the ark and the rain began to fall. Now the second one illustration is prepared. This talks about uh, two women grinding at the mill and one's taken, one's left. Two men out in the field, one's taken, one's left. One is prepared, one is not prepared. The third one is a group of people who are sleeping. It's like a thief in the night. He comes in when everybody's sleeping and they don't, they just don't know. Don't be deceived about his coming. Some people are deceived and they think that they know when the Lord is coming. Don't anybody who tells you they know that it's going to be a certain day, run from them people. They're false prophets. And anybody who says, well, I was in a meeting and they had a vision or a revelation and I've heard them all my life that the Lord is going to come soon in a year or two or next summer or whatever. I heard them 30, 40, 50 years ago. I don't believe those people either. But get your heart right. Get ready for the coming of the Lord. Then I'd like to read this scripture from Matthew 24, 30. And this is the sign of the Son of Man. That when he appears in heaven, this will be a real sign of the times. When you see Jesus coming down from heaven and all the tribes of the earth will mourn. For they'll see the Son of Man coming in clouds of heaven with power and great glory. They will mourn, it's true. It's true. Jesus is true. And they will mourn. In conclusion, I'd like to say Matthew 24, 
the basic message is not the signs of the times but be not deceived and i have to ask you how will jesus find you how will jesus find you when he returns will he find you looking for him as some are which is a great thing will he find you working for him because this gospel shall be preached until the end and then the end shall come to all the world and so real christians will be out there getting this gospel going and will he find you unstained with your garments white for him or will he find you maybe in an activity or a place where a christian really ought not be but you think that's all legalism don't tell me what i can't do well fine <laughs> get caught doing your unlegalistic freedom when the lord comes how will he find you have you been deceived are you looking for Jesus? Are you working for Jesus? Are you living unstained? Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, this is a big chapter and a lot to preach in a day. It ought to be preached in, in, in five or six weekends. But this is the end of the year sermon for today. Now bless your people and help them to keep these principles in mind about not being deceived. And help them to be excited about the coming of the Lord. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.